Well, hello there, everyone. This is Clint Finney, April the 23rd, 2020. This is a continuation of our Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web presentations. And today we've put together a virtual pasture walk. So basically, uh, Beth went home and she took some videos of some things of interest at her farm. And I took some videos of some things of interest at my farm. And we've taken them back and kind of melted them together to create this virtual pasture walk. Now, I will say, as I've said before, we don't really know what we're doing, but we're doing the best that we know how today. We've had some technical difficulties with videos and getting everything put together. And what we quickly found out is when you're out in the field doing a pasture walk, you've got lots of time to say all the things that you want to say. When you're trying to shoot a quick clip, uh, you, you miss some things or you say some things not quite right. So we've got some narrations as we go along too to kind of show people what we were trying to capture out there in the field. So I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Beth Krupsack. I'm a district conservationist with NRCS. I work out of the Hopedale Field Office covering Harrison and Jefferson counties, but I'm also very glad to be a part of the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. Um, we're facing some very strange times in our world right now. And since we can't all get together like we normally do for our pasture walks, we decided we would have a virtual pasture walk. So my husband and I bought our place in 2009. There's 42 acres here overall, but the majority of it is wooded. It, a lot of it was historically pasture, but when we got here, there was only this four and a half acre field behind the house that was still in grass and the previous owners mowed it like a yard. We built fence and have returned it to pasture. We've also cleared a little bit more, another acre up above here. I included a map of our operation because if you're like me, you like to kind of see visually what is out there, how things are laid out. Uh, you can see the home farm, the field behind the house is field two, that it's about four and a half acres. And it just has a couple hydrants and we run hoses to troughs and it's divided into about four strips that we subdivide. Depend how much we subdivide depends on the time of year and how the grass is growing. Um, field one has the automatic waterer. It's where we do our winter feeding. We use part of that field as a sacrifice area. I divide it with a poly wire. And then in the spring when the cows start calving, I kick them across into the side that's been fenced off and has some grass still left in it. Um, that way they're in a little better environment for them and the calf. Someday I'd like to do something different, but this is just where we're at at this point in time. And so once that field, the half of the field that was a sacrifice area recovers, we do graze it several times throughout the season. Um, field three is newly cleared land over the last couple of years. Uh, in the earlier video, I said we'd cleared about an acre. Uh, when I actually drew it in on the map showing where we're where we've cleared to at this point, I have found that we're actually about to an acre and a half now. When we bought this place, we had planned to clear much more. There's a lot of that wooded area that used to be open and used to have cows years ago. Um, but it's taken us a lot of time with us just doing it ourselves. It, it's a slow process and this is all the farther we've gotten. That field three, we do graze it, but it's still developing into pasture from woodland. It's, we probably graze through it a few times a year. And then I also try to feed some hay on it because I, I think it needs the nutrients and the extra seed sure doesn't hurt. So eventually it should be a fairly productive field. It's getting better. There is no permanent fence around that field yet. Um, we just put poly wire around it until we get a little further with our clearing, I don't really want to build fence up there, although I may build fence along the property line to at least have something to pull off of over there to make it a little easier. You can see on the map where the neighbor farm is relative to us, and I'll tell you the story about how the neighbor farm happened to be a part of our system in a, another slide but it's a, about a half mile from our driveway to their driveway. It's back a little quiet township road. 
and we do haul the cows from our place to theirs. We just load them in the stock trailer, haul them up the road and unload. We just have a set of crowd panels and they're used to it. We They all get in the crowd panels and then we load them in the trailer. We get there and unload and then when it's time to come back home, we drag the crowd panels down there, set them up in the field and load cows up and bring them back home. We are extremely grateful that we are able to have those extra acres. It makes a huge difference for us. Wanted to take a minute and talk about our cows a little bit. Um, I was blessed by my parents. Uh, their college graduation gift to me was a heifer for each degree. So that's how I was able to start off my herd. We have a fairly small herd compared to many. Uh, we generally run about three mama cows. Uh, this year there are four because we had a heifer that calved this year and we don't cull anybody else till we kind of give the heifer a chance and see how she's going to do. We have several generations at the same time running around out here. Generally we have the mama cows. We have almost two year old or two year old calves that are going to be processed for freezer beef. We have the yearlings that are being kept and raised to be next year's freezer beef. And then we have this year's calf crop. So depending on how many mama cows we have, you know, there's anywhere from nine to 14 or so total animals on our place. With the two year olds, it kind of works out because they usually go to be butchered in June. So it, it they're there for the spring flush to help us get through all the spring grass and then they're gone by the time we get into July and August when things get drier and, and harder to keep up with. So that works out really well time wise. We try to run them all as one group all the time. The only time that changes is when the bulls here. If we have some yearlings that are heifers that are going to be freezer beef and we don't want them to get bred, we'll have to pull them out and run them separate, which makes things interesting. But I just, I don't know of a better way to do it. We also have a random goat that hangs out with the cow. She, you can't see her in this picture. Her name is Izzy and she thinks she is the queen. The first year she was here, she stayed back at our place when the cows went to the neighbors. But last year, the first time around, she stayed back. By the second time, when that trailer came in and we loaded up the cows, she threw a fit and she was just running around, bawling her head off at the trailer. So we opened up the gate and she went in the corral. We opened up the gate and she went up towards the trailer. So we opened up the door to the trailer and she hopped right on. And she went over with the cows and she just stayed with them. I mean, she would go under the division fences and wander around, but she never went out on the road or anything like that. And the neighbors seemed to enjoy watching her too. So she's just one of the crew. Back in 2014, we went to an auction and had hoped to buy a place a little closer to our families. And it didn't work out. I made a little post on Facebook, mostly expressing how grateful I was for what we did have, although I was a little disappointed. And fortunately for us, our neighbors here, about a half mile up the township road from us, commented on the post and said, "Nothing. Nobody's used our fields in years. If you want to build some fence and use it for your cows, go for it. So in the fall of 2014, we spent a lot of time building fence. So you can see it's not expensive or fancy fence um, because it was just a verbal agreement. We just used T-post and wire and just that way if something ever changes, we can just pull it up and go. I don't really foresee that happening, but we just were trying to be smart about it. It does require a lot of work in the spring we normally have some damage from the deer. Actually, right here you can see the broken insulator. <laughs> Haven't been over here yet to start fixing this. Um, we usually run the cows through at home before we bring them here. So, there's about six acres in this big field. And we 
used to just separate it with temporary wire. I mean, completely temporary post, temporary wire. And that got kind of old. It was a lot of work setting up the fence. So we eventually divided it into strips. The strips are running up and down the hill, which is not normally how we would do it. But a water source for our field is a creek that runs down along that edge. Um, we use a trash pump and we pump out of it to a trough. Um, so we divide it going up the hill. We start out closest to the creek and move them up away from the water. I mean, we have as much line as we can to get away from the creek a bit, but it still works. We have to have a little bit of a pathway back to the water trough. And they're only in one of these strips for three days total. I mean, the most we divide them is into three sections. So even then going back on that alleyway, it's not going, causing too much damage. This property was very overgrown when we started. Nobody had farmed it for several years. So there was multiple rows and a whole lot of goldenrod over all three of these fields. We started out, we just mowed the perimeter and then let the cows kind of beat down what was out there and eat what they could out of it in, in the fall, the first year. And then in spring, without all the competition from the weeds, it came back decent and we just started grazing it like normal. So we've tried to maintain as much as we can with grazing. Um, we do try to mow once a year. We failed at that in this field last year. You can see some multiple rows some places. And that's why if you look in this strip, you can see where we did make some passes with the brush hog. On one of those passes, we got something in the tire, sliced one of the big rear tires of the tractor. So after we got that fixed, it we just never got back here to finish it. It just was one of those things that just didn't get done last year. So, but we can see the difference it made. So that there definitely are benefits to mowing to help control these things. I do spot spray some, but mowing seems to help a lot too. Since we overwinter the cows at our place, spring turnout happens at our place too. We start there. Uh, we usually do at least two rotations through there before we load up the cows in the stock trailer and move down here to the neighbors, which means it gives us time to get the fences repaired at the neighbors before we come, which is great. But it also means that the pastures get a bit ahead of us. So you can see on the left what it looked like by the time we got down there last year. And on the right, you can see what it looked like coming out of a paddock that first time through at this farm, um, I kind of squeezed the paddocks down a bit and we basically mob grazed through this tall grass. Uh, but then the rest of the season, we manage it a little bit more normal management intensive grazing type um, in at eight inches and out at four. The electric fence here is run by a fencer in the neighbor's garage. Um, they had a fencer already and they were kind enough to allow us to use it. We offered to bring ours and they said, no, just, just use this one, it's here. So we use that for the fields by the house, fields uh, four and five. We did for a while run a line across the creek to field six, but that just didn't work out so great. So now we just use a solar fencer for field six. I, I already had one, so we just brought it down and used it. And it's worked pretty well so far. There are two creeks on this property, one between that upper and lower field off in the distance. It's just a small, fairly seasonal creek. It gets mostly dry in the summertime. We did fence it out, and although there is a one point where the cows cross it to go between the fields, but it's fenced out like they only cross it's a controlled crossing. They only cross it when we open up the gates and run them through there, and that's no more than four or five times a year. And then there's a big creek that separates these next two fields and then runs along the whole edge of this field. And they're fenced out of that as well. Just doing what we can to protect water quality and manage things here as best we can. These are just a couple pictures to show you the creeks that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, the first picture with the kids is the Little Creek. This was in the spring, so there's a little more water flowing through it than there is later in the summer. Uh, the, you can kind of see behind them the trail where 
the cows would walk through. It's very minimal damage, and like I said, it's only a few times a year that they cross through this little creek. The lower picture is the larger creek that runs along the field. This is a shallower section of the creek in this photo. It varies all along there. Some of it's real spread out and shallow, and then there's deeper pools here and there. But this that creek is completely fenced out. Water is a little bit of a challenge on the neighbor's farm compared to home where we have pressurized water in the, all the fields. But uh, fortunately, the neighbors allow us to use the water from their house for fields four and five. We just run a garden hose from the spigot on the outside of their house and I fill the troughs daily. It is time consuming, but I'm a little afraid to put a float on there because if the cows knock a trough over or something like that happens, I don't want to risk running them out of water. So it's just something I choose to do, trying to be cautious of the neighbors who are kind enough to allow us to use their land and their water. In field six, we have this bigger creek that runs all the way along it. So we use a trash pump and we pump out of that creek. We don't necessarily have to do it every day. We use multiple troughs, so sometimes we can get away with pumping every other day. We try to set the troughs in different places on each rotation through if we can. Sometimes we're a little bit limited based on where the deep, deeper pools are in the creek. It has to be deep enough for the intake end to be underwater enough to pump into these troughs. So we only have certain places along the creek that we can pump and we only have so much hose, but we do try to move them as much as we can to eliminate damage from the cows watering there since they do come back to it usually three days in a row. As you can see, the kids love to go along and help. <laughs> um, they've been helping me since they were born, you know. So one of the unique things that we deal with at this farm is the fact that there's this larger creek that separates field five from field six. There's not really a good place to cross the creek with the cows, so we take them out here across the bridge, run temporary fence from the gate in field five, out along the edge of the road and across the bridge here. See this gate going into field six. The cows have learned that there's good grass on the other side. They don't give us too much trouble going across there. Sometimes the first crossing of the year is a little tough because you got new baby calves that have never done it before. And if you've made moves with cows, with young calves, you know how much of a pain they can be sometimes. So that part can be a challenge, but once they get the hang of it, it's not too bad. Here's the creek. It's not huge, but there's just the bank is a bit steep for them to get up on this side, so we don't don't try to do that. One last point I wanted to make sure to hit before I end my presentation is that today is April 23rd, and we still don't have our cows out on pasture. I know that seems really late, but we just it's been so cold. The Pittsburgh National Weather Service actually said that it is one of the coldest Aprils we've had as far as average daily temp in a long time. These cold days and cloudy days, not a lot of sunlight and freezing at night, we just felt like we should wait a little bit and get past some of that before we turn out. You may not agree and that's fine, but that's that's the decision we've made. Hope you guys have enjoyed this. Um, I know there's lots of things I forgot to say, lots of things I forgot to show you. It's It's been a learning experience on my end, but it's been kind of fun too. Just wanna say that we, we miss seeing all of you. It's, I know for me, the, the pasture walks is just one of the highlights of my job. I am I'm so thankful to have the opportunity to, to, to be with all of you and and see so many different operations and learn I mean, I learn something new every time, so really missing that. But 
hopefully we're doing okay to help keep in touch with you guys and and still continue a little semblance of that until things return to some sense of normalcy. So hoping that you all stay healthy and well, and we will see you soon. Well, hello again. Uh, this is Clint Finney here. I would turn the screen around so that you could see my ugly mug, but my uh, camera screen is cracked on the other side, so you're just gonna have to deal with me talking to you. Um, Staying today in a field I just moved the cows out of, Hopefully you can kind of see the grass. Um, we didn't graze this field last fall. We grazed it pretty hard during the rotation before. And then we uh, put red clover, white clover, crimson clover, and some bird's foot on here in the frost. And I uh, got some coming up. Uh, as you can see, we're just trying to top the grass just enough to open it up for the clover. Now knowing that they are eating some of that clover, but we're just trying to open it up. And uh, this is one of those fields that I come up here and said I, I could probably leave them till tomorrow, but I don't want to overgraze things now or ever. So uh, I, I just kind of moved them into the next field. And I'm going to try not to play a witch project with you too much and walk over to the field that we currently have turned cows into and uh, kind of see the difference. There was the fence reel. I haven't rolled it back up to shut the gate on the cows, but um, I got that four inches in some places. I got way more than that on some of the orchard grass plants. And uh, you can see down below us here is all fields we've grazed so far. Um, I probably turned out just a little bit earlier than I wanted to, but I did it for two reasons. One, hay's kind of short. Two, I guess there's three reasons. Two, the heavy use pad was sloppy and they were talking about a bunch of rain and I'd rather have cows on green grass than in a sloppy heavy use pad. And uh, three, our feeding tractor had to go in for service. So it was just a good time to go ahead and get them out on pasture. We're not real sure how this virtual pasture walk thing is gonna go. We've had some technical difficulties with video. So I'm not sure whether we'll get this one uploaded or not. But I uh, thought I'd give a quick shot here before the sun goes down. First, let me start off by apologizing for the poor quality on the videos that I shot. I, I assure you this is the first time I've ever had to shoot videos with my phone for any purpose. So I've learned, well, one, the lens is cracked, so I can't do any face kind of video, FaceTime, I guess, kind of videos. But then the wind kind of makes that video a little bit hard to hear and we've learned that we need to turn the phone so it's on portrait and not be so jerky with the video but so we apologize for it we're just trying to get some content out there for you uh the video also is very good at kind of showing the grass is blowing in the wind but it's not real good at picking out the legumes that are in that field uh, they're hard to see and, and i promise you i've got the video coming up here that we should be able to see the, the legumes a little better if not a still picture but there's about 30 percent legumes in that field uh, some of them were, were there and some of them now are coming from what we've seeded here this spring or this early spring uh, i mentioned in that video that I, I put crimson clover in that mix i'm not even real sure that i use crimson clover in the right place i'm not sure that it will work in a, a frost seeding but uh, I wanted to try it, and the co-op landmark had some, so I thought, well, let's let's give it a shot and see what we get. Uh, as I mentioned in a video before, we're just kind of topping that grass, trying to open it up and get some sunlight to those baby clover plants and get them to kind of go. It's been my experience that the grass grows really good early. It takes a little while for the legumes to get their feet under them. I think legumes really like a little bit more heat. Than the grass does and if we let that grass shade those legumes out early it seems like they never really pop they never really come up so that's just what we're trying to do i've been amazed at how good we've been doing at that with the cows and we'll talk about that more later here when we talk about the sheep too but uh, the field that i showed the cows just came out of they've been in there for 12 hours that field's 160 feet wide it's two of our contour strips that we used to farm put together so the whole field goes around the hill and it's about four acres so i figure i was giving them about an acre for that 12-hour time period we didn't graze that last fall hard 
so we had a lot more forage in that one than we had in some others that we've been through. Uh, but we just gave them that acre, and then I gave them the back side of the strips of three acres, and that got them through basically a whole 24-hour period after that. Uh, it's hard to see the difference in what they have and haven't grazed, I guess, also with the video, but you, you can kind of see that there, there's a difference, and, and the difference is that we're just trying to top it. There's still some some tall forage out there, still some taller grass that they didn't get to, but that's okay. They'll They'll come back to that later on. And uh, sorry, I didn't get cows in the picture, but uh, with that field going on around the hill, I had moved the cows and they kind of took off for the back of the hill. One of the challenges of spring grazing is we've got water at the farm every 250 to 800 feet when it's not freezing. But we've had so many frosts and so many cold snaps here this spring that I haven't turned the overland water system on yet. So uh, we've got water up front in that field that's frost free, but I don't have the overland system to be able to water them close by there so uh, when they go around the, the hill I, I'd let them I didn't want to call them back up to take a video of them and also you'll hear me intro and exit in videos the whole way through because we weren't sure which videos we were going to use and which one we we're going to keep so I apologize for that but that's okay uh, at least we got the videos for y'all to see well it's me again um, as I was walking across this field one thing that caught my eye that I've been keeping an eye on uh, this spring after we turned out was cow pies. Um, seeing whether the cows are getting too much moisture, whether we ought to add some fiber to their diet, some dry hay, I guess is more the right term. So I found this nice unmolested cow pie. And uh, you can see it's kind of sloppy. It does have a divot in the middle. We're getting about to the point where, yeah, maybe we ought to go ahead and throw some dry hay out just to be on the safe side. I'm hoping to pause this and, and go down to where we had cows uh, a few days ago. And that was the third day off the of hay. You can see that the cow pies are a lot more consistent. And that kind of goes with the theory that, you know, it stuffs in the cow's stomach for almost four days. So those first four days, we didn't really have to worry about it looking now. Like we, we may be thinking about that come Saturday um, when, when I've got the time to put the unroller on the tractor and go out and unroll some hay. Also, at the end of that last video, I uh, said I wanted to go down and take a quick short video of the cow pies when the cows had just come off of the heavy use pad and maybe take some successive days here and show uh, where they kind of went to and and folks I just I just run out of time um, run out of daylight that day to go around and, and take pictures and uh, so I, I've kind of pulled together some photos that kind of file photos that we had uh, some cow pies again I, I think it's kind of funny that we have a long dissertation on cow pies but uh, just a, a good good clue and a good thing to look at and be paying attention to uh, as we're moving our cows and we're walking pasture fields the other thing that i probably failed to mention we failed to mention quite a bit is you know watching that left side of the cow that that triangle that forms from their hooks and their ribs and uh is that area full you know we when we move cows we want to make sure that that area is full that's where their rumen is if it's full that means that cow is full and, and she's had enough to eat and we're moving them on to a new pasture and that's okay but we want to make sure their gut feel is, is good enough so that along with cow pies just are good visual clues for us to be looking for out uh, while we're moving cows this is clint finney as a part of our virtual pasture walk i was up here building fence the other night for the sheep you can kind of see them getting ready to move here and as I was building the fence, I looked down at the grass and it had just rained and boy, it looked so good. I was ready to pick a, a handful of it, take it home and eat it like a salad. And if you guys know me, you know that I'm not a person who eats salad on a regular basis, but this grass up here just looked so good that I was ready to pick it and take it. This is a field we spread our composted sheet bedding on last fall and uh, had frost seeded clover the winter before. 
didn't really take so we reapplied some clover here this spring um, maybe if I have a failure already this spring it's that I brought the sheep up here instead of taking them somewhere else from now on we won't uh, graze the sheep on a field we've just seeded to legumes again because we have to watch them really close to make sure that they don't take up those legumes don't don't eat them the cows don't have to worry about them getting at the legumes but the sheep have such a small mouth they can pick out and pull out the legumes where we don't want them to so if my phone will last that long I'm gonna go ahead and move the sheep here send them into this pet paddock um, the paddock their ends long and skinny and goes down along the road the reason it's fenced that way is because my neighbor's house is right over the edge there and uh, they don't haven't complained about having to listen to the dogs bark but I really don't like them to be there at night they've got a, a couple month old baby I like to fence it this way almost every time we go through and graze this field there's uh, around 30 ewes in this bunch and then last year's weather lambs and and new lambs are in there they'll start lambing here about the first of may dogs scarlet petunia are gonna play around here and jump in you hear cows fall in the background because there's a couple grass fed steers over there on that hill um they're waiting there kind of getting ready to be put in here with these sheep the rest of them will be here this summer and join the start the cows. So, um, I, I really wanted to get this, this kind of field videoed um, just to show this is the kind of grass we're moving sheep on right now we're really not taking a whole lot of it I apologize I'm trying not to start turn make somebody car sick but there's a little little patch of trees on top of this hill in fact this is this spot's in the running for for where my house is eventually going to get built but uh, just walking down through here through this field you can see the neighbor's house there um, they're really good neighbors and they don't complain but I like to keep them good neighbors so I make sure I don't keep the dog there overnight when they can bark but as you can see it don't hardly look like these sheep have been in this field maybe around the trees my wife moved them in here this morning because we only graze this field during the day we'll probably put them back in here tomorrow for the daytime and then we'll move them out the clover really didn't take over here against these trees anyway it wasn't grazed hard enough because we just never graze this this section really hard so um that's about it for the sheep. I was hoping those grass-fed steers that come over here, maybe I'll go over and take a quick video of them. I can promise you that forage was wet and glistening in the sun when I was up there the first time, and I really did think about taking a, a bunch of it home and, and seeing how good it would be to eat. I, I really honestly did think about that. That's a video that I had planned out in my mind for several days uh sorry for the cows bawling in the background i know it kind of takes away from things i i hate the sound of cows bawling that tells me that they're hungry but that particular crew is is really not hungry they just know that they belong with those sheep they spent all summer with them and they know when i'm up there moving the sheep that they should be moving with them too and we'll get into that here later on in the videos i talked about the clover not taken in that video and um the reason is because those sheep have such small mouths they can go through and they can pick out the clover and they like the clover so they pick it out and they, and they picked it out last year before it really got a chance to set down root and and they took all of the vegetation from above the ground i mean we talk about that all the time about we can't take it all and and sheep are really good at picking that out so from now on we'll we'll graze the cows on those fresh seeded fields i'm amazed at how good we've been able to do with the cows this year on the, the fields we have seeded and how we've been able to open them up and, and hopefully the clover will really just pop out of there now that it's been opened up and it's not competing with the grass for sunlight i apologize too i didn't think about how much that video uh showed us moving cow moving sheep and uh 
I know that's one of the big points of contention for moving animals. I tell people that I move cows every 12 hours and move sheep and, and move steers. And, and they say, well, that just takes forever. Well, you saw the length of that and how long it really took me to move it. I, I build all the fences or try to build all the fences for, for a week on Sunday afternoon. So it takes me maybe two or three hours. But that's okay because it's two or three hours out on the farm uh, on a four-wheeler where I can shut it off. I don't have the noise. Ethan and I can walk around and build fence and kick over cow pies and look for earthworms. And we make a, a kind of a day out of it when we're out there doing it. And then when it comes time to moving sheep or moving cows, that's all I do. I just grab a hole in the fence post, make a gate out of it, swing it open and let them through. With the cows, I'll pick the reel up and untie it and roll it back because there's a lot more bodies to have to go through. But with the sheep, uh, the reel on that particular fence was down on the other end. So I, I build all those three strand fences with one reel of poly wire. So it's all tied on that one post. I just unhook that post from the high tensile wire. And all I have it is just tucked underneath one of the high tensile wires. It's not hooked to it for electric. And just use that as my gate handle and use this, the next post back as my gate hinge. And just let them through and I'm done. I just put that right back again. Uh, for those of you that don't know, and, and here again, these videos kind of take legs sometimes. These are Katahdin sheep. They're shedder, shedder sheep. They they shed their hair or wool sheep or hair sheep, I guess. They're not wool sheep. So right now is, is when they really start shedding. And here in a week or two, I really, I really don't, don't want to show anybody them because they really look kind of bad because they're shedding. But that's what they're that's what they were bred to do. They're bred to shed their hair. So I don't have to shear them. Uh, the wool is not worth anything anyway. So uh, it, it's just a good set of sheep to raise for me because I don't have to hire a shearer to come shear off wool that's worthless in the end. I um, wanted to take just a second to mention that savanna kind of look up there on top of the hill. That's really a cool kind of view. Those are mostly locust trees, but there's some others in there, some cherry and some other things in there, but that's all kind of come from the, just the fence row growing out. But we're able to kind of manage that as a savanna, and that's a great feel for the sheep in the summertime because if it gets hot they'll, they'll go in our, underneath those trees and shade up and but it still grows forage on the ground and those locust trees are not they don't have limbs real down close to the ground so the sunlight gets to the forest floor all the time so we do get grass growing in there and that's a that's a really good scene to kind of see that's kind of what we want shaded areas to look like if we're going to have shade we want it to be able to get sunlight and be able to grow some appreciable amount of forage and then it didn't look like that field that I'd walked through had been grazed, but I assure you it had. Um, we didn't put the sheep back in there for one more daytime. And when we got done, they probably took half of the forage. Uh, but it, it really, with sheep, it's a whole different look than with cows. The cows, they're, they're kind of top down grazers. Sheep kind of pick through and, and take what they want. So it's, it's a different kind of judge to know whether they it's been grazed enough or not, depending on whether it's sheep or whether it's cows. And then I, I said something about that field not having very much clover in it. We don't graze it hard enough. It doesn't get enough, there, there isn't enough sunlight hitting the soil to get those frost seedings to really take. What I will say is that field is really high in organic matter. And so it's pretty high in soil nitrogen anyway. One thing that we talk about is when we get in the levels of organic matter up in the threes and fours and fives, uh, we've got enough soil nitrogen kind of in that soil to keep things going so uh, would i like to have clover in it sure i would do i want to graze it hard enough to, to get the clover to grow not with a neighbor's house right over the edge so we just manage that field differently than we do most any other field on the farm as promised i came up here to show you the grass finished steers um this steer here is just a shade over 24 months of age it's been all winter on stockpiled grass as you can see he's pretty well done um i was hoping to get him in last fall but just processors didn't have time the other heifer there on top of the hill sees the other one going same time that steer there goes um her and i had a little disagreement last fall about staying in fences and uh we decided that she needed to go in the grass finished uh part of the operation here the other three there those will be fall process steers or two of them will be the other little guy there is our young herd sire lenny he goes back to the lentz herd out in oklahoma he's just a baby um 
woods, but and, and somebody will probably ask why is he running with a heifer? Well, that heifer is going to the slaughterhouse anyway. She gets bred. That calf ain't gonna be big enough to even notice. But uh, I wanted to show these guys because they, I don't know that they ate a bite of hay all winter long, um, but still come through the winter just in fabulous condition as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I was concerned midwinter that maybe we weren't giving them enough, but really they came through just all right. Those two younger steers grew a lot of frame, didn't grow a lot of fat, but they've got all all summer now to, to put weight on. Um, really, I guess we had a discussion in the fall about the quality of stockpiled grass and I think this really shows you the quality of stockpiled grass versus hay. I don't have any cows that look this good even though they got some they had mineral and salt and, and good hay all winter long they still don't look as good as this group does so plus they, they were on hay they've kind of come up or on stockpile and kind of come up on fresh grass so I don't have any real worry about them getting any dry matter because their stomach's already set to it so um, just a good picture for the virtual pasture walk of of what stockpiled fescue stockpiled orchard grass a lot of it was too can do for you and and what condition the animals can go in we don't have to have a discussion about what to supplement or or what our hay test was when we got steers that look like this coming through the winter as i watch back over that video uh one thing that comes to mind is that whole picture video to, to real life thing again um that steer that I had there in the video, uh, I know in the video he doesn't look like he's as, as done or as finished as, as I know he is in real life. He's got a big fat brisket. He's got fat cover over his ribs. He's got a fat roll right at the top of his tail head. He's done. He's finished. He's ready to go. Uh, he was ready last fall just with a mess up in processing. He got to stay through the winter. Um, <clears throat> And and I guess while we're there, we we'll probably ought to have a little conversation about finishing and grass finishing in general. Um, those are the clues we want to know that a steer is finished. Um, those things that I just talked about. But also, we we need we need to be looking at that fat cover in a different way. I, I guess I don't want to talk bad about the grain finished steers people grain finished steers and that's fine it's part of our industry it's part of the way we do things with cattle but uh, i see a lot of grain fed steers that are, that are way overdone um, they just got lots and lots of fat cover on them and we have to look at that fat as as it costs money to put fat on things so we need to have the proper amount of finish but we don't need to have boatloads of finish on it on a particular steer or heifer um i think I use I go back to the to my hog industry days and you know we used to say in the hog business that you know we hated fat because it costs money to put on and it costs money to get rid of it uh, because it, when it goes through on the cutting floor and, and they cut that fat off it goes in a garbage can now I'm sure there's some way to market that fat but I'm just saying we, we need to watch ourselves and, and make sure we're getting the proper cover on them proper finish but they don't have to be overdone. We don't expect them to be overdone. I'm by no means saying that a grass finished steer is supposed to be lean. That's not true. It's got to be a good eating experience. It's to be a good eating experience. It has to have fat cover. To go through the cooling phase in the slaughterhouse, it has to, it has to have that fat cover. But uh, what I'm saying is that we, don't, we have to be mindful that we don't want to put too much forage into something that's already done. He, they're, they're done. So... Um, I talked a minute about that heifer, kind of flubbed that up. Um, she, she's she been with the bull, but I, I, in no means, I said calf, I, I meant embryo. You know, if she is bred, it's going to be a very small embryo. She's going to be short bred. It's, it's not going to be a problem for that going through harvest to, to go to the, the, the butcher. So um, that's why I don't worry about it. In fact, sometimes having the bull with those heifers that are at finishing level, is not a bad thing because they're not coming in heat they're not pushing fences they're not trying to get back with that bull so sometimes it, it works out to our benefit to have that bull with them that's it, not really by design here it's just the way things had to happen with us here this winter but uh not not a big deal and 
I, you know, I just want to clarify that. Uh, I, I looked at Lenny there, um, the bull that we just bought him last fall. And uh, for us, he, he was a bull that is kind of based in grass finishing as he was he was eating there in that picture. You, know, you can see he had a big, wide mouth and he takes big, wide bites. And, and he, like I said, he's just a baby. So uh, he got a big, wide heart girth to him. He's a smaller frame kind of bull. Now, I don't, I don't want him really, really small, but I do want him smaller. I do want my cow herd to smaller than it currently is. Uh, even though they're not big cows now, I, I don't mind having them a little bit smaller. So that's what Lenny's here for. It's it's just our next step in grass kind of genetics that we want to have here at, at our place. Uh, like I said, I don't want them too small, but I want them to be able to be marketed in commercial channels if, if I need to. Uh, but I want them to be smaller and be more grass efficient. Uh, and then I, I talked about stockpile. Um, we actually talked about in the January meeting. I said it was in the fall, but we talked about in the January meeting that we were able to have and how much our stockpile for it so often is of equal or better quality than the hay that we make in the eastern United States. Allen Nation used to write, Stockman's Grass Farmer used to own Stockman's Grass Farmer, used to say that uh, quality hay east of Mississippi was, was sort of a joke. Um, and, and our stockpile grass almost always will beat our hay quality. And, and this just kind of proves it. Uh, I think looking at those steers and that heifer that came through winter on stockpile, didn't have a bite of hay all winter long. I have pictures of them grazing in the snow, what little snow we had last winter. Uh, th these are just visual clues to show us uh, what stockpile storage can do for us and, and can do for our livestock herds. Uh, I, I think all of us should be looking at extending our grazing season and using utilizing more stockpile forages in our stored forages for our winter feeding program. I'm going to try to record a video on how to use the grazing stick and what exactly is four inches of forage. I've had that question come in, so I wanted to try to cover that in this pasture walk. So I got my grazing stick. Here again, my screen's busted, so you're going to have to look at my face during this. You can just watch me use the stick. But when we turn out in the spring, we said we'd like to be at four inches. So we take the handy dandy grazing stick here and I'm just trying to get around to the right side. There, and you probably can't see it in the camera, but there's the ruler. And we just stick that down in the forage. And you probably can't see from home, but when I'm looking at it, I can see a six, but I can't see a five. So to me, that's five inches of forage. And I can walk around this field and do that several times and kind of get an average. I did one here just a minute ago and it was four. I probably, you could find some threes in this field, but that's how we gauge what is four inches of forage. And then we try to just take half and leave half. Now realizing that half half you take may not be two inches, that may be an inch and a half or something like that because the density of the forage goes down as it gets taller. So we've, we've done the other measurements in the pasture walks previous, but here's the side that measures your density. So I'll kind of kneel down here and show you what we do, but we just kind of slide that through the forage. And then we get over top of it and we count how many dots can we see. And I know y'all at home can't see it, but uh, from where I'm looking, I can see maybe two dots. So two dots says that we've got 200 to 250 pounds per inch of forage out there. I would say it's probably 250 because I can barely see that one dot. You kind of got to use your common sense a little bit, but 250 an inch is what I typically figure early spring pasture on. So I've got five inches of forage out here. That's 1,250 pounds. So I only want to take about 600 or less. So just so you know, if we're measuring forage and we want to know how much we have, there again, I did it. I can see the five, I can't see the four. So somewhere in that 
four to five inch range is what we call this field. Um, I didn't put my phone on panoramic this time, so I realize you're looking at a thin computer or phone screen to look at this. But also while we're up here, I had a picture the other night of the grass-fed steers and uh, sheep and told you they were going to come together in a couple days. Well, they've, they've finally done that. Uh, they ran into each other in their rotation and so um, but there was five in here steers and now there's only two there's other grass fed steers other places on the farm but um, this group I just had separated because the bull needed a buddy and two steers were going to the processor so it ended up being three steers because three of them come through the gate the bull and two others but uh, this just keeps the bull separated from the cows here until we're ready to breed and uh, did that kind of interesting. I just set a mineral tub on one side of the gate, set a mineral tub on the other side of the gate, sorted the two that are going to the processor through to one side of the gate, just walking around and using their flight zone. Uh, made sure the other three stayed on the other side of the fence, and there they were, separated easy as pie. So um, just wanted to give a quick minute about the forage sample and show you kind of where we are today. If you can see the trees off in the distance. That's where I shot the video there three or four days ago. That's how far the sheep have moved. We're giving them six posts by 32, so that's 32 foot apart. I can't do that math quick in my head, but uh, somewhere around 160 feet, something though. No, it would be almost 200 feet. And uh, this field is 256 feet wide. So whatever that comes to in an acre, that's what we're given. 30 ewes, 20 lambs, fattening lambs, and these three grass-fed steers uh, a day. And I'm not going to walk down there because the wind's really blowing, but I'm telling you, when you take them out of here, you can't tell that they were in here. Uh, and that's kind of the way we want to do it. One last thing, I'm getting long on talking here, but I had a question come in today. In these spring pastures, would we, if we had a choice, would we graze them too much or, or tighter than we want to or would we go back to fields earlier than we want to and I had to think for a minute and I said well the answer to that question is I'd rather put them back on hay than do either but gun to my head in the spring if I had to, to choose one I would say I would rather move on to one that's not quite ready than to graze one too short and that's kind of the answer I'd give all the time but I still, in the summer, we would rather just go on hay or go on some other feed or find some other forage somewhere. But I guess if we're faced with that choice, gun to our head, we'd rather go on to something too early than graze something too short. It takes grass to grow grass. If we don't have grass, we're not going to grow any grass. If we're already growing some grass, especially in the spring, if we take it, go a little bit early, that's really not going to hurt us as bad as taking too much grass. With that, I'll sign off. I know the wind's probably driving all of you crazy. Hopefully that gives you a quick view of how to use a grazing stick. Of course, we could use a rising plate meter. We have to calibrate it or get the right calibration for it, but same kind of tool. Uh, the grazing stick is easier to carry and easy to deal with. It's probably not as scientific or as down, right down to the pound as a rising plate meter would be. Important to note, too, that those those grazing sticks, rising plate meters work great with forages 10, 11 inches and less. If we're grazing something really, really tall, they really lose their effectiveness. And at that point, I go on, I go based on what the animal's grazing. I, I know how many pounds the animal I have out there and how much, how many days or how many hours it takes them to graze a certain piece. And that's how I, I judge what forage is out there. Um, sorry, I had trouble managing the stick and holding the camera. I was going to have Ethan come up and help me with that, but Ethan's really just getting into wanting to count things and i was afraid when he went to counting dots he'd get to 100 before i was done and it'd really like make it look like my field didn't have any grass in it uh, of course you want to average any of those measurements that you get from from that stick you want to do it multiple times probably like soil samples you want to do almost 20 of them just to kind of get a gauge for what's out there if you really want to get it down close and then I, just a, a second of I said in there that the forages get denser. Well, they, they, the forage is heavier the closer we go to the ground. So uh, where we may say that it's 250 pounds per inch, it may be 300 down close to the ground. It may be 100 up in the leaf canopy in the top part of the forage. 
uh, just that those are just good tools to to sharpen our grazing eye and figure it out. I'll be honest, when I went up there, I said, "Well, the field's four inches," and I was surprised when I put the the stick down and got five because I, I just need a recalibration every once in a while. Um, just note also that your inches and, and your density will change pre and post grazing. We talk about grazing in inches and, and really we, this is where people get confused. They think, well, I put the cows out there and they graze some really tight and some not. Well, yeah, because we're talking about average. Uh, we're not talking about them grazing uniformly. They very rarely ever graze uniformly across the field exactly perfect. So especially this time of year, it's hard to get them to, to graze that way. I talked about the steers kind of coming together there. They 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 did come together, but then I sorted the two fat steers off because the cow herd is going to come by those fields here in a couple of days and they'll pick up with the cow herd and go on. So when I was talking about sorting, I had five in that group. And I uh, sorted the two fat steers off and left the three, so the two young steers and the bull. And, and and that was just pure stockmanship. I just put mineral tub on one side of the gate and the other, sorted the two fat steers off and shut the polywire gate and then turned the fence on. So that's how good our cows are trained to polywire. And then also just being calm and easy around cows and moving them, just using their flight zone. You know, I did it all by myself and, and got it done. and. And they sorted and separated animals that have been together all winter long. And in a couple of days, they'd moved off from each other. It's kind of how we wean calves, too. Uh, I finished the math there. Um, we had 1.1 acres, what we were given those a day. I know I kind of stumbled on the math. I, I'm pretty good with math, but usually I got a calculator in, in, in my phone. So I'm able to, to get that all done. Um, and then from the grazing question there, just also realize we're always going to be going back earlier than normal in the spring. You know, we're not going to have that eight to 10 inch grazing height in the spring until the second or third rotation, probably, because if we would let it get to eight or 10 inches, it would it would be way too, too past prime. Uh, yeah, it'd be fine that first rotation, but by the second rotation, it'd be making seed head again. So realize we're not going to have that eight to 10 inch height that first time. So we're going to be going back to fields earlier than we usually would in the spring just because it's it's the spring. It's the way we manage things in the spring. Well, that's a wrap for our virtual pasture walk. I win today by saying thank you to the sponsors of the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. Uh, also, we want to say thank you to all of you for tuning in, not just to the virtual pasture walk, but also to our other web presentations. It's been nice getting comments and kind words and questions and things in the office as we work through kind of these unprecedented times. It's our uh, hope to continue to put web presentations together until we can meet again, until we can have a face-to-face -face meeting again. But uh, it's my hope that we can I can make them a little bit shorter going forward uh, just because we feel like it, by putting this virtual pasture walk together, we've, we've satisfied some grazing curiosity and, and got a good amount of content out there just in this one presentation but I, I do feel like I, I've got some good topics coming up that uh, we want to cover things we we, not, we need to talk about and uh, looking forward to doing that so with that I'll say we'll see you next time <laughs>